Hello, and thank you for joining us for the board meeting tonight. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. When you join, you heard as an audience member that you are in listen-only mode. You cannot unmute yourself to speak, and also I cannot unmute you. If you would like to submit a public comment during the public comment portions of the meeting, please use the questions tool to type your comment and send it to us. If you're on a desktop or laptop computer, this is located at your top right with a question mark. If you're on a phone, iPad, or tablet, this is located along the bottom toolbar with a question mark and the word questions. Please type your comment in this area and hit send. This message will come directly to me and I will read your comment out loud to the board. The agenda also indicated that public comments may be sent in advance via email to comment at prparks.org. If you're having troubles with the questions tool on the platform, feel free to email your comment to comment at prparks.org. And I'll also continue to monitor that email during the meeting. Now I'm gonna turn things over to President Coyne to begin the meeting. Great, thank you. I am calling uh, to order the regular meeting of the Park Ridge Park District uh, Board of Park Commissioners. Today is Thursday, October 15th, 2020, and it is 7.04 p.m. Uh, roll call, please. Commissioner Grau? Here. Commissioner Harrington? I'm here and I'm trying to get on video, so hopefully shortly. Mr. LaDuke? Here. Mr. Leach? Here. Mr. O'Donnell? Here. Mr. Tunnel? Here. Mr. Coyne? Here. Thank you all for being here. Um, would anyone like to amend, add, or delete an item to the current agenda? No? Uh, how about, do we have any public comment on non-agenda items? We do have one. And I've got the commenter right here. Do need to be recognized. Yes. Hi, I'm Nola Duke, representing Pack 50 Den 1, Arrow of Light. My den and I were talking about the parks, and we have a question. Is there anywhere that the park district can put a playground equipment for older kids? Many of us still like to go to the park, but we are outgrowing the current playground equipment. One example of something we would be interested in is a climbing wall. Thank you. And thank you, Noah. You're welcome. Thank you, Noah. Any other any other comments? I do not have any other comments. Great. Um, okay. Um, I now move to approve the regular board meeting minutes of Thursday, September seventeenth, twenty twenty. This action will be formally ratified at an actual uh, board meeting with physical presence at a later date. A roll call vote, please. A second. Please. Oh, sorry, need a second. Put that in my script next time. Commissioner Grau? Yes. Commissioner Harrington? Yes. Commissioner LaDuke? Yes. Commissioner Leach? Yes. Commissioner O'Donnell? Yes. Commissioner Tunnell? Yes. Coin. Hi. All right. Now um, I move. Um, I move to approve the destruction of verbatim recordings of closed session meetings, as identified in Exhibit A, and direct Park District staff to destroy said verbatim recordings as soon thereafter as possible, as practicable. Practicable. This action will be formally ratified at an actual board meeting with physical presence at a later date. Do I have second. a second? Commissioner O'Donnell, second. Thank you. Um, any discussion? I had a question. Okay, um, Commissioner LaDuke. I, I wanted to know, um, I, 
you know, I have no problem uh, still getting rid of the things that, you know, date back 15 years or so. But in terms of things from the more recent, like the 2018 era, does any of it pertain to current litigation? On the chart, it shows, let me check here, right here, 2018. There's land acquisition, probable or imminent litigation. So there, yes, there was one probably on February 15th, but we already approved the minutes. Right, but in terms of, of course. I, I talked to the attorney today about this, and the only um, the only way someone could FOIA these is to assure that that is the topic we talked about. So they can't FOIA and listen to the tapes. They can only use it to um, confirm what we talked about. So um, the minutes have what we said, because I so I don't know if he's here, but that's how he described it to me. That's the only way they could be FOIA'd. All right, I just wanted to make sure we weren't destroying anything related to open litigation that we shouldn't be destroying. Are there... Kirk, are you on? Maybe you or Marianne can give a little background on this. Yeah, I'm on now. It, it, it does this to me every time. It, it makes me a part of the audience, I think, and then, so, and I just hit the join webinar. So I, can you hear me now, I think? Yes. yes. Hello? Yes. Okay, good. So the question is uh, on the tapes. Um, I'm sort of lost a part of the conversation there, but here's the background on the tapes for legal reasons. Uh, the tapes exist for one reason only, and that is to determine whether or not you committed a violation of the Open Meetings Act. And the statute of limitations on that is six months, but to be safe, this, the legislature required that you keep it for 18 months. And again, that's the only purpose, so that the PAC or a judge determining whether you discuss things that weren't supposed to be discussed in closed session could do it. And so since you can't bring a complaint after the six months or certainly within the 18, then they allow you to destroy them even automatically as a policy. So we're, we've got a lot of cleaning up to do. These tapes take up a lot of space. They also deteriorate over time anyway. Uh, and the minutes that you've approved of each of these meetings for which there's a tape is the actual record of that. It doesn't matter what's on the tape. So that's why we're playing catch up and why the time is now to have this done. And um, yeah, and we're, the only other thing that might keep you from destroying it is if you were subject to a subpoena that told you to preserve them, but we don't have any active litigation that requires that. so. We're good to go. Great, thank you. Any other questions or comments on, on this? Any other questions, comments? No? So let's uh, call the roll. Commissioner Harrington? Yes. Commissioner Duke? Yes. Commissioner Leach? Yes. Commissioner O'Donnell? Yes. Commissioner Tunnell? Yes. Commissioner Grau? I abstain. Commissioner Coyne? Aye. Thank you. Okay. Um, Making sure I'm not missing anything. I'm not. Um, now we're on to report uh, report of park officials, and we start with the president. That's me. Um, uh, we're going to uh, have discussion and possible approval of changing meeting time for the November 5th and uh, December 3rd, uh, 2020 regular meetings. Uh, this is uh, in order to deal with the budget. So I, um, I move uh, to change the starting time for the regular board meetings on Thursday, November 5th, 2020, and Thursday, December 3rd, 2020, from 7 p.m. to 6 p.m. 
at the same meeting location for the purposes of budget presentations and any other district items to be determined. This action will be formally ratified in an actual board meeting with physical presence at a later date. Second, everyone. I was wondering, I was hoping that we would have a second and not everybody <laughs> not want to start at six o'clock. I was a little nervous about this one, of all of them. Uh, any discussion? Then um, let's uh, call the vote, please. Sure, I'm sorry, Commissioner Harrington? Commissioner Duke? Yes. Commissioner Leach? Yes. Commissioner O'Donnell? Yes. Commissioner Tunnel? Yes. Commissioner Grau? Yes. Commissioner Coyne? Aye. Thank you. Um, now, uh, the next on the report is our attorney, uh, Dirk Price, if you're still out there. Okay, trying that again. There we go, I'm unmuted. The uh, I don't have anything additional to report this evening, um, other than we got through the everything we needed to get through on the uh, minutes. Any questions of uh, Dirk for anybody? No? Okay, Executive Director Mountcastle. I have a few things. Good evening, everybody. Um, first of all, thank you for all agreeing um, to the 6 p.m. start time. I think it'll, um, as, as we all know, everybody looks so forward to the budget meetings, but um, at least if we start earlier, you know, we won't be going even later, I should say. But um, in terms of the budget, uh, you know, that's been the focus of a lot of the work um, for the staff and um, don't have to probably mention this, but it's going, you know, it's been extra challenging and, um, you know, extra just a, a lot of, um, I shouldn't say guessing. It's a, it's a lot of um, forecasting um, that is very different due to COVID, of course. Um, so, uh, the staff's been working very hard on that. So, um, you know, it's moving along, which is great. And everybody's been very good about just really um, digging in and looking at things differently and creatively and all across the board. So that's number one. Um, speaking of COVID, um, you know, we, of course, continue to operate in limited um, capacity in phase four. And so, uh, going very well, considering everything. I will say that, you know, the staff um, across the district has been exceptional. Uh, it's been very challenging in a lot of different areas, especially our um, facilities and, um, you know, the operations with, um, you know, not as many staff. And so the staff's been doing a great job. And we'll talk about the finances and, you know, anything else related um, under the different reports, unless anybody has any questions about that. Um, good news uh, this week, financially, we um, received um, notification from OSLAD that we are getting, uh, that it has been processed, and I don't know if we've received it yet, um, but I heard this, I think it was Wednesday, um, that we received, we're receiving a half, 50% uh, of our 400,000, so 200,000 towards the Woodland project. So that's very good news. Um, so we should be seeing that come to us very soon if we haven't received it yet. Um, and then the only other thing, um, I don't think any of you really dealt with um, at Paderma, Ed Dutton, but you may have, the president in the past may have. Ed is the um, director of legal services and, and uh, general counsel at Paderma, and he's been um, amazing um, to work with and just a wealth of knowledge, but he is retiring in January. So um, that will be a little change for those of us that deal with the council there. Of course, we deal very heavily with Sarah Yeager and then they're bringing a, another uh, deputy general counsel on as well. So I'm sure things will be smooth and I'd, 
uh, promised me that he'll be available. Um, we, we've been dealing with him with some certain situations. So, um, so happy for Ed, uh, but I thought I would just mention that as well. So I have nothing else on my general report. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Gail, is Sarah moving into that general counsel role? They didn't say. They said that, you know, between Sarah and this new gentleman that they'll both be deputy general counsel. Um, so I haven't Good. heard that yet, but, you know, maybe they're, uh, yeah, so I'm not sure. They didn't okay. indicate that. Thanks. Um, but Sarah, is, you know, um, Harmony had the pleasure of working with Sarah as well, but I mean, she's excellent. So I, I have no doubt, you know, for the organization that, you know, they will not skip a beat. So, but Ed, Ed certainly was, you know, he was very important to that organization. Um, if there's no questions, we've got a marketing and a H, um, human resources report. If there's any questions, I, um, Margaret or I would be happy to answer those. And if not, that would conclude my report. Great, great. It's hard to juggle all of the different documents and stuff on a tiny little laptop screen. So I apologize for the delays and being muted. And whatnot. Okay. Um, let's move on then to, um, so do we have a, well, we have the marketing and public relations report. And uh, so let's turn that over to um, um, me. <laughs> That's fine. I already asked if there was any questions, but I, I yeah, can, you know, I can. I just want to make sure that we hit the topics because they had your names next to it, even though I couldn't even read it. So, That's and okay. I know your name. So, my name's, my name's Gail Mountcastle. Nice to meet you. Yes, sir. Thank you. <laughs> so, any, nothing to, no questions for her, no questions for, uh, uh, on human resources, no, then we can move on to reports uh, for finance. We can turn it over to Commissioner Harrington. For sure. And I get to turn it over to the hardest working woman in finance. We've drug you through the ringer here the past seven months, but um, appreciate all of your continuing hard work and effort. I know that you supplied a written finance report, but perhaps you want to give a brief summary for the board. I'm sure. Thank you, Commissioner Harrington, for those kind words. And I just want to throw a shout out to the finance staff who I could not do all this work without. Um, everybody's been working really hard throughout the district. So um, appreciate that. Uh, the finance report begins on, on page 18 or 19 if you're looking at the PDF file. Um, I did want to highlight uh, or kind of update that uh, the meeting with the IEMA consultant that I had this afternoon was very helpful, um, and I expect to submit the uh, FEMA grant application within the next week or so. Um, also, uh, we have an agenda item to approve a resolution for uh, Cook County's uh, coronavirus relief funds application. Um, these are funds uh, under the CARES Act. Um, which they've allocated $5,000 for each park district. Um, I still need to determine which expenses uh, should be submitted under each application, but the guidance that I received today was helpful. Um, so I don't plan on making any revisions to the county application. I think it should work out the way I wrote it up. Um, otherwise, uh, there's a lot of, uh, financial detail information in my written report and um, the IT team continues to support the district needs uh, both in person and remotely. Um, so I'd like to move on to the monthly report by funds and the projections to go over some of those financial details unless anyone has any specific questions in the in the written report at this point. I, I did have one question about IT. Um, mm -hmm. Was there a reason that we had a server at Main Park? Was that for redundancy? You, they're all going to be at um, Prospect now. And I remember when that was all installed, and it seems like we're undoing or redoing some of the stuff that we did. Um, so 
there was when we set everything up at Prospect Park, um, we did not have all of the servers located there. Um, and then we've done some virtualization of, of the servers, right, since we had that set up. Um, so kind of the last piece in order to complete that is to move over the, um, the, the file server that was left behind, because um, that's where it was originally located at Main Park, um, to move that over to Prospect. Um, we had completed the um, portion of the redundancy that reside that does reside at Main Park, so it's um, just kind of uh, the last piece to kind of have everything in one location and then all of the redundancy at the other. Okay, I, it was just so long ago I couldn't remember. And, right. Uh, so it's part, it was part of the long-term plan to migrate everything over to Prospect. Yes, and it was part of our capital plan for this year. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any, Any other, other questions? questions? I had one about your IEMA meeting. So, um, you know, I see the application. We're going to be discussing the motion later for um, county funding, um, county COVID mm -hmm. support funding. Um, so from an Illinois funding perspective in terms of emergency funds for COVID relief, what um, dollar amount are we looking at again applying for? Um, so the <clears throat> county uh, allocates $5,000 for park districts in Cook County. Um, the uh, IEMA um, is administering the FEMA funds the federal mm -hmm. funds so um I, I had estimated that we had um identified about forty thousand. there might be a little more there's a there's an end date now of september 14th um so i have to kind of double check that we used everything um through that time period before i have the exact dollar amount um and uh so that's kind of the estimate of, and, and they would, um, if they approve the expenses, um, would reimburse up to 75%. And that's like PPE, sanitation, other types of equipment that was needed in the short term. Exactly. Um, we did okay. have some barriers, uh, PPE, gloves, masks, um, things Dine of that it. nature. <laughs> Yeah. Signage, for sure. For signage yeah. is actually. I see a lot of it, signage uh, bills coming through the roster at each week. Sounds like it, it meets um, FEMA's mm -hmm. criteria best. The the PPE okay. is a little while while obviously needed just for COVID. Um, it still seems um, unclear as to whether uh, FEMA will approve it for not first responders, but we're gonna make our best case. So, Great. but signage Thank communication you. seems to be something that is explicit in in the grant instructions. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. So, Margaret, could you uh, help me share my screen? Yep, give me one second. Sure. Okay. All right, so the monthly report by funds, um, I would just thought I would highlight the um, the fun, funds report beginning on page 25. So the first report are, is the all funds. And we can see here, um, if we look at the bottom, um, the net surplus deficit um, that- Are you intending to share? Because it's not up. Oh, I apologize. I thought I did. No one can stream. 
people can see your screen. Okay. Make sure they're seeing the right screen. Mine says waiting to view Sandra DeAngelis' screen. So something still isn't right there. I'm sorry, I must be having a weak connection. It's starting, but we just see your go to webinar browser right now. Okay. You just need to move to the document. Can you see it now? It's slowly rendering. <laughs> there you go. Now we yeah. see it. So I think you are slow to render, so you might want to talk slow and move slow through the document. Okay, if thank you. I'm looking to see if there's anything I can shut if I need to tell people, someone to turn the streaming TV off. Okay, thank you. So I wanted to highlight the um, net surplus line at the bottom. And this is all funds. You can see here that we are about um, 300,000 better than budgeted and um, 36,000, 37,000 better than the prior year. Um, so when we look at all funds, this is really attributable to um, the slowdown in capital spending. So the next page shows the general fund. And here again, we see that our net surplus uh, is about 500,000 compared to budget. And it, it, excuse me, better than budget and about 125,000 better than the prior year. And this in the general fund, I would attribute to um, our revenues being uh, close to what was budgeted in what we had last year, 95% um, ish, and the strong expense control. Um, because of the pandemic and the adjustments that we've had to make. So moving on to the recreation fund, this is where once again, and we've seen this um, over the last uh, several months, this is where we really see the impact of the pandemic um, because we had to shut down and what we've been able to, um, to do uh, under the reopening guidelines. Um, you can see that our net, uh, so our, we have it. We're running a net deficit uh, year to date at this point of almost 500,000, and that is uh, 1.3 million less than what we've budgeted at this point in time, and it's about 1.2 million less than uh, what we did the prior year. Our next page shows the capital fund, and this is where we can see that our um, total expenses of 1.1 million are um, about 2 million less than what we had budgeted uh, at this point. And it is um, higher than uh, where we were last year, but we had higher capital expenses uh, budgeted for this year. And the last page of this fund report shows the operating funds. So again, this is our, you know, the general and recreation funds combined, excluding capital and uh, excluding debt service. So here um, we see that our, sorry, my screen is, Adobe is uh, giving me uh, our uh, net deficit, our net we're running a net surplus at this point in time uh, of the year, but it is 
scroll up here so we can see it. It is about 700,000 less than what we have budgeted and about a million less than where we were this time last year. Um, I do want to point out here that, again, um, where we've made some adjustments, you can see that uh, salaries and wages to date are 75% of what we have budgeted, benefits are 80% of what we have budgeted. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight here on the recreation fund side, um, when we look at the program fees, while we've only received about 35% of what we had budgeted, um, that it's also adjusted on the expense side where our program instructors are 33%, the supplies are 40%, and the contractual expenses are 34.6%. Uh, so they're in line, these expenses are in line with the revenues from the, the programs. So I just wanted to highlight that. Um, and does anyone have any questions on the report by funds? Okay, hearing none, um, if it's okay with Commissioner Harrington, I would Propose to move on to the um, updated financial projections. Sounds great. Alrighty. Um, so, what we talked about, or one of the, the last thing, I guess I'll kind of come back to this a little bit. Um, when we look at the, uh, the property tax receipts uh, through the end of September, we we're at um, about 94% of what we have budgeted. Um, so uh, that is that is great because you know we were budgeting conservatively, not uh, or in our projections, considering the property tax receipts uh, conservatively, not knowing um, for certain what the impact would be. Um, but at this point, I think uh, it looks like we're on track. Um, we received more receipts in October uh, because if you were, were, will recall, the um, county changed the penalty date to October 1st. So we did receive another good chunk um, in the first week of October so that through October 8th, um, we've now received 98.5% uh, of the budgeted property taxes. So that's um, been reflected in the projections. Um, kind of go through here and see that um, with those adjustments, um, our projected uh, moderate case scenario now looks um, quite a bit quite a bit better. Uh, the other kind of big adjustment I made to the projection was rather than using 85% uh, um, collection rate to bump that up to 96% looking forward um, in 21 um, because based on our experience here in uh, 2020 um, that hopefully the impact on property taxes wouldn't be um, so bad. So that's kind of really helped the moderate case scenario, where as we kind of I left the stress case scenario um, with that same assumption of a 75% collection rate, because if things get really bad and people can't pay their property taxes, uh, that's where we'll really have uh, a lot of difficulty. Otherwise, we didn't. I didn't really make a lot of changes to the projections. Um, but uh, because we did receive a lot of uh, property taxes here in September, um, it has improved our outlook uh, for year end under the moderate case. Um, so it is now showing a 
fund balance as a percentage of 2020 budgeted expenses, um, the 32.15% uh, translates into 3.8 months of expenditures. So that's pretty good news, I think. Um, on the stress case scenario, we've uh, continued to um, include this estimate. Um, you may uh, have heard and I've been watching and seeing that it seems like the uh, cases continue to tick up here in Illinois. Um, the potentiality for uh, if we had to completely restrict uh, operations again. Uh, so the stress case shows a shutdown occurring in November, December, and January. Um, that is where these zeros are coming in. Um, but for year end, because through September now, again, this is actual, um, we only have three months and only two months of the shutdown here, we're still uh, looking at a fund balance uh, as a percentage of budgeted expenditures of uh, almost 30%, which uh, translates into um, about 3.5 months of expenditures. So as always, we'll continue to um, make adjustments to these as we have more information, as we um, finalize our budget proposal, um, we'll be able to update the um, the 21 expectations in the moderate scenario to uh, better match our budget and um, continue to think about uh, how we can model the stress case um, for the unknowns uh, going into 2021. So I think that's what I wanted to cover. Does anyone have any questions about the projections? Thank you, because I know it's doing triple work um, to try to um, chart out each of these projections, but I think it's extremely helpful given we're amidst pandemic um, with its ups and downs. Uh, I did have a question about budgeting going forward. So are we essentially going to be looking from a budget perspective as we start talking over the next couple meetings about a moderate and stress, et cetera, type budget? Is that what we're thinking we're going to have to just determine as a board? Because um, I find it really hard to think about settling in on one budget, knowing we're kind of operating in three universes right now, depending on what certainly the months of, um, you know, especially January, February, March may look like. Sure. So um, the budget process really, um, our, our goal is for the, you know, the board and to approve a budget and appropriation ordinance, right? And the key there is um, the appropriation. So that's what governs our ability to spend as a public entity, what amounts we can spend. So we wanna be careful about what revenue we're projecting. So, you know, I've kind of gone back and forth and around about that. And that's something that we'll, you know, be talking about a lot with our um, budget presentations, um, again, these assumptions, um, because the less revenue we have, then the less, obviously, we're able to spend. Um, but do we want to not count on revenue so much that if it should materialize, we're not able to spend it would be a problem as well. So we're trying to kind of thread that needle, and we'll talk through that as we give our budget presentations. Um, but the other thing is um, on the appropriation side, we want to be able to accommodate um, spending should things improve. So the direction that we gave to staff, which my hope is that this will kind of be a middle of the road enough to be reasonable yet allow some flexibility, is that we continue to expect that we're in phase four with the restrictions we're currently under and what that means for our revenues and expenses um, through the spring programming. Um, and then for the summer months that we would be able to reopen all the pools 
have camps running again um, that we'd be able to the the um, and we're looking at if we should be able to move into phase five at that point, what would we expect things to look like? So that is how we have tried to approach the budget. Um, hopefully that gives us enough flexibility appropriation wise, um, whether or not we're able to actually be in phase five. Um, as we've seen this year, when we have less uh, program revenues, again, we have less program expenses. So we're able to make that adjustment. Um, so that's kind of how we've approached it. Um, I hope that makes sense because if we're not, if if we're in a position where we're, if things are running, you know, everything's kind of going gangbusters better than expected, we don't want to have to um, redo the whole budget all over again so that we can accommodate programs if that makes sense yeah if i could yeah, jump in here a little bit that, that, i was yeah. going to say that's really that's really well said i would say commissioner harrington that you're it's going to come down to in terms of the budget ordinance the appropriation ordinance between the sunny day version and the um moderate version those are going to be the two the, mm -hmm. the most stressed version you would never pass because if, if uh if a vaccine is available if we're able to operate if you're, you'd automatically be handcuffed about bringing people back getting pools open because you hadn't appropriated the money so in terms of your two scenarios i think you're going to want to have one that you pass which is the sunny day best case and then have for the public to say but we've also thought of the moderate case here it is uh, and, you know, although we're not adopting that as our appropriation ordinance so that we can serve you, uh, we do have it in the background. We have thought about it. We're not being spendthrifts. That would be my piece. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Dirk. No, and that's what I was trying to get at, just to get us all in the right frame of mind as we move into kind of budget season. It's different, unlike any of the past iterations I've participated in, wanting to have that flexibility, of course, wanting to be able to go sunny day and continue to provide as much programming and operations and capital projects as we can, but also thinking through realistically, are we going to have to reopen the budget if we don't see those revenues coming in? Um, and we're not able to say we move back to a phase three, where does that leave us from a budgetary standpoint if we pass the sunny day budget? I mean, does that hamstring us uh, because we've budgeted accordingly, according to a much more positive outlook versus what we actually have on hand? Dirk um, and Sandra explained it very well um, in terms of what we're looking at for the actual budget is our, I would call it, Sandra, what, the moderate case scenario um, from as best as we can know, right, how long we're going to be in this right? Um, so we'll continue to do what, what we're doing monthly and make adjustments, you know, as necessary, you know, within our, um, I guess, our operation. Um, and continue you can to do this. You can always spend less than you appropriated without having to adjust the budget. You can't spend more. So that's the, the rule. Okay. Thanks, you guys. Anyone else have any questions according um, around Sandra's scenario? No, but... Scenario? Go ahead, I, Commissioner O'Donnell. I, I just want to clarify because I, I kind of heard... Um, conf uh, conflicting statements between Superintendent Moncastle and uh, Dirk. Um, I heard Dirk say we should budget the sunny day scenario, and Director Moncastle, I heard you say we're more thinking more in line of budgeting the moderate scenario. So, could you comment on that, please? Sure. I think, and Dirk, jump in if if I'm saying something that putting words in your mouth, but. The appropriation is the sunny day number, right? So we can appropriate up to um, a certain percent higher than what we budget. So in that case, that will be our sunny day ability to operate at full steam ahead. Precisely, that's exactly right. Your, your, you're going to your ordinance that you're appropriating 
may take a sunny day perspective. But your budget, what, you, what you're actually thinking in terms of hiring, your capital projects that you're looking ahead to doing, um, you know, you, you're going to have a moderate scenario for it, but you're going to appropriate as though you could do everything you used to have on your A list for capital. Because if you got the income, if the revenues materialized, if everybody was back like we hoped, you might want to go ahead with those projects. So, um, again, budget is the, you know, it's going to be a working blueprint for Gail to plan for staff and program going forward, all of which will change overnight, I guarantee it, because of, you know, COVID's resurgent or, or whatever we learned from being back in school, all that's up in the air. But if you don't appropriate, if you don't take, uh, say, if you only took uh, Terry's top five, and appropriated for those projects, then if the money came in in the sixth project and seventh project, you were ready to do them, now you hadn't appropriated them. So now you can't go. So the appropriations ordinance needs to be sunnier than what you think you're gonna operate by at this time, just so that you have the flexibility without having to have a pause of, of a notice for a public hearing to amend the budget, to do Oh, so, so it, and that's if you can even fit within the parameters of the amended budget for an additional appropriation. So, um, you know, all along, Gail has, uh, and, you know, they've, and Sandra have masterfully done all three of these scenarios for you, but the appropriation ordinance needs to be um, as positive looking as you can reasonably stand so that your staff can go as quick as possible to provide services if they have the revenues to do it. I guess, and I would just add that um, as far as the scenarios that we've been looking at over the last few months, what, what I'm thinking about is that once we have agreed on what the budget will look like that the moderate scenario would mirror the budget for 21. That Unless we sense. have to start adjusting it. <laughs> so so uh, does that mean we're optimistic about this winter? Gail, are you hearing things? Are, are you know, do we have a projection of what this winter might be other than? Oh, I, I mean, I, I, I don't have a crystal ball, of course, but I, I'm not. We're not budgeting for optimistic. We're budgeting for phase four for winter and spring. I'm hopeful that um, we're being a little pessimistic and that we'll be back to you know um, normal operations, which you know normal. I think we're not budgeting as we have been. I haven't seen all the numbers yet, but um, we realize that it's a new normal, right? It's not going to be a normal like right away with camps, et cetera. So, um, yeah. So, I no, I have not. I've just heard what everybody else has heard about the cases in Illinois. And um, nope, I wish I wish I've heard that there was a vaccine that's been passed, but that's about, I think, when we're going to get vaccine. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, it's all a guessing game, and that's got to be really hard. But um, I appreciate this discussion because it helps us understand better uh, the parameters you're using, and helps us feel comfortable that we'll spend it if we have it, and if we don't, we're going to adjust. Well, I, I tell you that it will. You know, it's going to be painful because um, we're looking at. You know, we have we have taken a lot of you know a lot of things out of the budget. Um, for instance. One of the things that we're talking about is special events, you know, things that don't bring in revenue. Um, so that'll be a discussion with the board. Um, you know, I don't know, we're at a version. I have a lot of meetings next week to look at, to dig into a lot of the numbers, but some of the discussions this week, you know, um, there's, there's frozen positions, you know, there is um, no conferences. There's no, you know, there's a lot of things that have been taken out to make, you know, we're, our goal is to bring you a break even budget, operational budget. Um, and, you know, typically we bring you a budget with, you know, a bit of a surplus to transfer to capital. But our goal this year is to bring you a break even budget and we're trying hard to make that work right now. So that's where we're at. 
not to be doom and gloom, but um, you know, st- the the staff's been doing, like I said, a great work at, at estimating, you know, something that's really tough to estimate. Any other questions? Sure. <laughs> Any other questions before we move on to approval of expenditures? There we go. There's everyone back on my screen. I don't see any other questions. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and move on to our uh, motion. I move to approve for payment vouchers in the total amount of $463,504.66. This action will be formally ratified at an actual board meeting someday with physical presence at a later date. May I have a second? Second. Any discussion? Seeing none, can we have a roll call vote, please? Commissioner LaDuke? Yes. Commissioner Leach? Yes. Commissioner O'Donnell? Yes. Commissioner Tunnell? Yes. Commissioner Grau? Yes. Commissioner Harrington? Yes. Mr. Coyne? Yes. That motion passes. On to our next motion. Um, I think it was from previous discussion. It's regarding the Cook County COVID-19 reimbursement program. We'll take some money. Um, I move to adopt resolution number 20-4, a resolution to approve an intergovernmental agreement for participation in Cook County local government COVID-19 reimbursement program. This action will be formally ratified at an actual board meeting with physical presence at a later date. May I have a second? Second. Thank you. Um, Oh, I was talking on mute. Superintendent DeAngelis, maybe you want to um, share a little bit of additional detail on this one before we vote. Um, sure. As uh, I outlined in the report, uh, the resolution is uh, required to accompany the application. The application uh, I drafted uh, was included, um, so I tried to write a good explanation as to why um, We've uh, incurred these expenses. Um, so, uh, anyone have any questions? Seeing none, may we move to a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Leach? Yes. Commissioner O'Donnell? Absolutely, yes. Mr. Tunnel? Yes. Mr. Grau? Yes. Mr. Harrington? Yes. Mr. LaDuke? Yes. Mr. Coyne? Aye. And the motion passes. Um, I'll turn it over to Commissioner Grau now for our recreation report. All right, April, are you ready? I'm ready. Hi, everyone. Um, My report is on page 57. A few highlights from September. Um, Our outdoor pools and batting cages officially closed. I know that seems like forever ago, but um, our fall programs have begun. Both virtual and in-person programs continue. the team is very creative in what they're offering and trying to keep a lot of things outdoors as long as possible. In-person preschool program began as well, and it's it's going very smoothly. The Camp Ridge program also continues, but starting this week, now that District, District 64 is in the hybrid model, we're definitely seeing lower participation. We're in um, continued communication with the staff at D64 to possibly have the programs in the district locations if space allows them at a later date. So we're regrouping with them after they're a few weeks into their program, their hybrid program. 
The participation remains fairly consistent at the activity center, fitness center, ice rink, and the driving range. A couple of previews for October, um, our fitness center did open the locker rooms this past Monday with the cooler weather approaching. Um, and that's going very smoothly so far. There are some events taking place for the fall holidays, including 25 families and three different sessions of the Halloween Hoopla event, one being this evening, uh, and about uh, 130 cars coming through our drive through Trunk or Treat event next Friday. And we're still looking for volunteers to pass out candy if anyone is interested. Put that plug in. We also started our registration just this past Monday in our basketball scrimmage program, and we have over 200 participants already. So that's very exciting. Um, all the proper restrictions will be in place for that. And um, I believe this was highlighted in the marketing report, but our November and December brochure will be released tomorrow with a lot of new and exciting programs and registration begins Monday. That's a few of the things going on. I would be happy to answer any questions about the report. I have a question, uh, Commissioner Leach. Yes? Yes, um, on the basketball uh, program, did I read it correctly that masks were going to be worn by the players as they were playing? And if, and if so, is that something that the state guidelines have mandated or is that something more conservative than the state? Uh, guidelines are mandated. That's uh, more conservative, and the different locations that we're using are using um, have different guidelines in place. So we went with the strict protocol. Well, actually, actually, it is in the in, in the all sports guidance. The difference is between indoor and outdoor. And so, for indoor basketball, it says as a minimum guideline, masks should be worn by all players, even while playing. The all sports guidance says only outdoor activities can you take off the mask when you're when you're uh, involved in the activity. But it's very clear as a minimum guideline. So take that for what it's worth. That's not shall, but it still calls it a minimum guideline. Then they use the word should, but it's still a minimum guideline that you're supposed to wear a cloth face covering while playing. So we're not being overly conservative. That is what's in the DCO guidance. Uh, that's Paderma's guidance too, that everybody should be following the DCO guidance lest we be accused of being wanton, willful, and reckless. Uh, and so um, while it was at a time to be considered more conservative, as was pointed out by April, it's no longer more conservative. It is in fact what DCO wants. Thanks, Dirk, for clarifying. We did, I probably should have specified a little bit more also. We've talked about having some um, outdoor practices as well, if we can find the space um, on, in our locations to do that. So, yes, we went back and forth with a lot of options in a lot of different locations. But thanks for clarifying that. Well, the only, I just the only comment to... I have, uh, Commissioner Leach, real fast, and then I'll see, see my, um, the gavel. Um, I actually just want to commend the staff for finding creative ways to get indoor basketball going. As some know, I am familiar with the guidelines. I am glad that there's youth athletics still being able to be offered by the park district in the winter. So again, April, thank you and your staff for working with legal, with everybody else to make this happen. Appreciate it. Thank you. It's definitely very challenging with the space, especially with half of our largest gymnasium at the fitness center being taken up by the fitness equipment, um, but definitely explore, explored all options and um, happy to see the participation coming in. April, I just wanted to chime in too that um, the staff was great about and it, it was very helpful when we met with um, State Representative Stevens, um, that we are using a Rosemount gym. I don't know if that was um, also, I just thought that was good to point out as well, so. That's awesome. That's great. Well, thanks for all the extra work you do just to, just to make it appear normal. The team is trying very hard and 
you know, the hurdles, but it's nice to see the, the, the faces out there and if you drive past Main Park and see the nature programs and the, the things happening outdoors, it's and all the fitness classes too. That's very rewarding to see everyone out there and participating safely. So the weather's about to change all that right about now, right? Right. Yeah. You know, yeah, we talked about, you know, if there's a nice day trying to have some pop-up fitness classes, you know, and doing whatever we can do. The indoor classes have definitely not been as popular, but we've been seeing more people come indoors. We now have a goal to shoot for every year at the Oakton Driving Range as well. <laughs> Those oh numbers goodness. are phenomenal. No, no, it's crazy. <laughs> All right, no other questions? Thank you for good work as always. I'll turn it over to, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I just said thank you. Oh, I'll turn over to Commissioner O'Donnell for Buildings and Grounds. Thank you. And uh, I yield the floor to Superintendent Wolf. Thank you. Um, my report begins on page 64 of the PDF. Um, as you can see, we've continued to be very busy with uh, just capital projects that were on the list of projects to move forward with, as well as a lot of operational uh, items. Um, we were very excited to get the uh, pathways paved over at Main Park uh, recently and um, really excited that we now have a uh, accessible trail uh, completely around the pond for anybody in our community to um, participate in. So um, that was one of the, the primary goals of, of, of that portion of the project. Uh, some of the grading had to happen um, so that the pathway was at the right level and the right slope. And so I think that's something that um, we as a park district should be really proud of that we have that opportunity for um, for our community members. So um, <clears throat> I, uh, I also, um, it's not in my report, but uh, if I could just take a minute to um, point out that um, our, one of our park ambassadors uh, specifically wanted to call out uh, officers LaFrancis and Brown. Um, as always, we have a great working relationship with the city police department especially when it comes to things going on at night and communication with our park ambassadors. Um, just the other day, we had some um, some kids pulling uh, paper towels out of one of our, um, you know, hand washers and, and with the wind, they were blowing all over the all over the park. And they took their time to help uh, pick up those paper towels uh, when they could have actually had a little bit of downtime in between calls. So I think that was really great and a good, you know, opportunity to show how we are working collaboratively with the city when it comes to keeping the park safe and clean and um, and up to date. So um, I want to thank our park ambassador, uh, Karen Zemek, for sharing that with us, and of course, the, the city police. Um, also, if there's any questions uh, related to my uh, report, um, I would be happy to answer them at this time. Can I ask a quick question about the main park uh, pond? I know that you um, talked about them in your report, but I know that that's been a project this board has been committed to over the past few years in terms of getting in there and really starting to um, make some positive changes. It sounds like we've had a little bit of a setback though, um, but now we've, we're trying some new avenues. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, so we're, you know, we had done some dredging. Um, we had, you know, consulted with a, a, a pond maintenance company in the past and they had suggested that we remove um, the sediment from the pond and that that would have a significant impact um, in in the overall pond health because it wouldn't allow there to be um, an abundance of nutrients that would then be feeding the algae etc. Um, as you know over the last few years we've invested time and money in doing that um, on the west pond um, however this year we didn't see a, a lessening of that like we did last year but rather we saw what was quite honestly it increases what it looked like to me um, you know, some of that we do attribute to, um, you know, timing, um, or, you know, staff not being available and trained and certified to be able to, you know, do an early um, spring treatment of the pond to help with the early algal blooms. And so I, I think part of that was we didn't have staff here. Um, we don't currently have anybody certified on staff with aquatics license and the ones that were supposed to get certified in spring couldn't because all those, pro all those were canceled. So we had 
a couple of things that kind of worked against us. Um, in the meantime, it caused us to kind of reevaluate, is that really the path forward for, um, for the East Pond as well? And so I decided to reach out to a couple of, of companies again, and uh, we're working with another one right now just to see what other options we have because, um, you know, we, we still feel like there's some, some room for improvement. Um, interestingly, with all the companies that I talked to, they all started off with, wow, the, those ponds are a real challenge. They're very shallow. They've got, you know, a lot of the property around uh, the east one, at least, is not controlled by us. So we have really no control over what's going into those ponds uh, and difficult access for us to be able to manage and maintain that pond. So, um, you know, they all I quickly identified all their difficult challenges and everything in their efforts to help us or come up with a solution. Um, but are still working forward with us. So um, we have actually come across in the past that um, for one reason or another, uh, these ponds tend to have a lower uh, dissolved oxygen level. Um, last year, or perhaps the year before, um, you know, we started taking those oxygen reading levels ourselves before we made any applications because we were also conscious of the potential for fish kill that we want to avoid. And um, it's been a constant issue for us. And so now we're kind of getting to the point of a further and deeper analysis of the water and the overall you know, system there to see, is there something else at play? Is there something else that can be done? Um, what's the issues here? So um, we're, we're continuing down the path of trying to find you know, good aquatic health for those ponds. Um, but you know, a reminder that these were you know, man-made ponds many, many years ago. And you know they have very very shallow waters, which works against us in so many different ways. So, um, but we're 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 doing the best we can without getting to the point of trying to put in a large, you know, geyser fountain because that kind of doesn't go in line with the nature center feel. If we have to get there, we might get there. But you know that's what we're we're working with right now. So, thanks, Terry. I wish there was a university we could partner with to do some studying of the the ponds and some thoughtfulness around it. Yeah, it's uh, thank you for yeah. trying with an, another company. I know we did. Um, we've all seen it with our ourselves, um, and we've made investments over the past few years. But I know we've also gotten a lot of patron comments, um, especially this year with the significant algae blooms. Yes. Any other comments or questions for Superintendent Wolf? Okay, hearing none. Do you want to move on to the resident request? <clears throat> yeah, um, so on page uh, 67 of the PDF, um, we've shared an email uh, with the board um, from uh, a resident, uh, Chris, uh, who has um, reached out to us. In fact, I first met him and heard of, of his uh, request during um, uh, an Oakton referendum meeting, I believe it was at, at Roosevelt School. So. Um, this uh, initial request goes back a ways, but uh, recently um, he had put in a request in writing to uh, Commissioner Harrington um, in, in requesting that there be some sort of um, crosswalks uh, along Prospect uh, Avenue to gain better access to the park. Um, and so we thought it was important since he was reaching out that we make the rest of the board aware of this and, um, and share that, that request of his. Um, I will mention that um, he has uh, been in contact with um, city engineer Sarah Mitchell on this case as well. And um, the city has already taken a stance that this, um, this area and a long prospect um, doesn't really warrant um, a, a crosswalk based on its criteria. Um, so since some of those emails have exchanged, I've had a chance to revisit this uh, subject with uh, city engineer Sarah Mitchell. And you know, she had identified that it really comes down to the city's past practice for the last 16 plus years um, where they do not install unprotected crosswalks. Um, and by unprotected crosswalks, it's like a crosswalk that doesn't have any means for a vehicle to stop, like a stop sign, stop light, et cetera. So they're not gonna paint lines out there to identify a crosswalk unless there's a way to actually stop a vehicle. Um, so then, you know, the follow-up question that she puts out there was really why not just add some stop signs to one of the intersections along Prospect to help make this, um, you know, access a little bit easier for people to cross Prospect Avenue. 
um, she did point at this at this point to the city ordinance which adopts the manual on uniform traffic control device installation um, it's the accepted standard throughout the country really and that's what their city ordinance adopts as well um, this is a federal publication that's put out by the department of transportation and really guides all the different scenarios in which you would install any sort of traffic controls in any given area um, these are looked at um, you know very often in fact she's looked at the intersections along prospect um, several times over the over the last few years um, just to see if this makes sense and these decisions based on that manual are, are based on vehicle and pedestrian loads as, as well as the length of time um, that you can find a gap in the traffic to cross safely um, you know so with that um, you know Sarah's indicated that they're really after all the times they've looked at this they just haven't seen um, any reason um, Sarah and I both uh, shared that um, we have only had uh, just the one request over the past five years since Prospect Park has been open um, and it's both been for us by the same person to install this crosswalk so um, I, we did feel it was important for the board to understand and hear all this um, but I, I I'm in, in understanding and I I trust the city and their expertise in this area right now. So I just thought it was important for that to be uh, discussed and I'd be happy to answer any other questions if there are. Anybody? Um, Terry, go ahead. Let me saying something, sorry. Um, I, I'll just continue um, just so we can get through and then we can go back to, there was two aspects of the concern. Um, the, from the resident and the other question that he asked was and indicated it was a larger issue to him is a connection, a linkage between Northeast Park and Prospect. And I know everybody um, on the board was not here when Prospect was developed. So I just thought I would um, just speak to that for a moment that there were, um, there was an opportunity for property that was, um, we could have made, you know, this linkage. Um, there was three property, three lots at the time. It would would have been along Washington, across from Northeast Park, on the park side, on the Prospect Park side. Uh, however, at the and so we did investigate that. Echoing. Is somebody not muted? Oh, I'm probably not. hard to remember that. Uh, so anyway, we did when we were exploring all the different options for the property, because we also saw the benefit in linking, um, a, you know, at the minimum, a crosswalk uh, or a pedestrian um, entrance, it just seemed natural or a, a, vehicle, a vehicle entrance. And after talking through this with the city, um, before we, you know, move forward with any of that, they they definitely said that they would not, um, you know, they would, I don't know if they ever came out and said, absolutely not, but it was a firm enough answer that we changed directions that they said that they would not be in favor and probably would not approve a vehicle access because of um, Washington being one of the main thoroughfares through the city. Uh, so we were looking at the property for a pedestrian entrance and it was determined by the board at that time and the staff that the dollar amount to purchase uh, one of those lots was um, the, the cost of it outweighed the benefit for a pedestrian access at that time. Now, it, it certainly is a, you know, a certainly good point, um, and we thought so at the time as well, and still do, but it's at what price. Um, you know, do we go, you know, look at property that may become available along that street? So that can certainly be a future discussion. So I just wanted to add that in. So if there's questions on either uh, segment of that, we'd be happy to answer. Anybody? I think, um, yeah, I was just going to say, I appreciated um, Chris bringing that to me and bringing it to the board. I think as a new park, Prospect as a new park, it's important to see the way in which our residents use it and want to have access to it. So I think um, as a board, I think we keep our minds open as we move forward to see if there's increased demand for a crosswalk in that space to see if that, you know, additional usage and, and ingress 
to the park is, is necessary. I'm just trying to think. I got to go back and drive through there, but how far, you know, the uh, crosswalk is um, to the south and to the north to get to that park. And I think it's important for us to kind of think through as we're thinking about our newest park, is it as accessible as it can be? It, it, it almost sounds like if we had a lot more vehicular traffic going into and out of Prospect Park, if it was getting more use, we could justify putting a stop sign right at our entrance and therefore a crosswalk with it because then the city would, um, you know, have that hard stop for the vehicles. So, you know, again, to uh, what Commissioner Harrington was saying, if we can, if we monitor that, the use of the park in both for um, vehicles coming in and going uh, uh, during the seasons and also uh, pedestrians, uh, then we have a, uh, then we can have some facts that we can go back to the city with maybe. Yeah, and I will mention that um, Sarah Mitchell did say that, you know, they do um, reevaluate areas from time to time. Um, you know, if, if something does change and we do, uh, you know, notice or other residents notice that there's an increase or change in both pedestrian or vehicular traffic, um, that they could reevaluate. They recently had an area um, within town that within the last few weeks that they've added a stop sign over in the main park um, area where um, it had been brought up a few times before and they had evaluated it wasn't there, it didn't meet the criteria, uh, but they did just recently reevaluate and it did meet the criteria, so they made that adjustment. So they're not. They're not close minded to it either, but they've got their criteria that they follow. And um, just in that particular situation, it doesn't need it quite yet. So, but they're open. Any other questions or discussions on uh, this resident request? Okay, hearing none. Um, we have a couple of motions to go through here. We need to approve membership with OMNIA Partners Cooperative Purchasing Group. I move to approve the district's membership as an end user in the OMNIA Partners Cooperative Purchasing Group. This action will be formally ratified at an actual board meeting with physical presence at a later date. Second. Second. Any discussion? Lieutenant Wolf, do you have any comments, um, further comments on this one? Um, I, I just want to point out, as it's mentioned in the um, memo in the board packet on page 68, that um, this would be the purchasing group that uh, we would intend to use for uh, the purchase of the snow equipment, which is the next motion we'll be reading. Um, just for a point of reference, um, in this uh, situation, um, by using this purchasing group, uh, we would be saving uh, about four thousand, uh, about forty-six hundred dollars. So. Um, so to me, that's the benefit in, in joining this purchasing group, and it also opens up additional opportunities in the future. Any questions or other discussion? Uh, hearing none, uh, let's please do a roll call vote. Commissioner Leach? Yes. Commissioner O'Donnell? Yes. Mr. Tunnel? Yes. Mr. Grau? Yes. Mr. Harrington? Yes. Mr. LaDuke? Yes. Mr. Coyne? Aye. Okay, so that passes. Um, now we move on to purchase authorization of the snow removal equipment that Superintendent Wolf referred to. I move to authorize the purchase and delivery of a Ventrac 4500Z with a heated cab and power broom attachment through a joint purchasing agreement with OMINIA partners from Reindeers, Reinders Inc. under contract number 2017025 in the amount of $33,715.54 and to authorize the executive director to execute and deliver such purchase. This action will be formally ratified at an actual board meeting with physical presence at a later date. Okay. Second. Second. Awesome. Come on, okay. John. 
Superintendent Wolf, would you like to comment on this one? Uh, yes, I have a board memo on page 69 of the PDF uh, board packet. Um, as you can see, uh, this was an item that we had budgeted for in 2020. Initially, we had um, talked about postponing it, but at the last meeting, I brought forward the idea of moving forward with this purchase. Um, we did budget 34000 for this item, and as you can see, this would then be uh, under budget. So. Anybody have uh, any other questions for Superintendent Wolf on this? Okay, ma'am, we have a roll call, please. Mr. O'Donnell? Yes. Mr. Tunnel? Yes. Mr. Grau? Yes. Mr. Harrington? Yes. Mr. LaDuke? Yes. Mr. Leach? Yes. Mr. Coyne? Aye. Okay, and the motion passes. So I have one more. Um, we have adoption of ordinance number 20-5, disposal of surplus property. I move to adopt ordinance number 20-5, an ordinance authorizing the sale of used personal property owned by the Park Ridge Park District. This action will be formally ratified in an actual board meeting with physical presence at a later date. Second. Superintendent Wolf. Yes, so on page 70 of the uh, PDF of the board packet, um, there's actually a uh, joint memo for myself and uh, manager of marketing and public relations, Holler. And um, this would take the uh, gas lamps that were located at Hodges Park and allow them to be um, uh, auctioned off for a fundraiser uh, through the uh, Friends of the Park. Um, I believe that was everything, Margaret. If you had anything else to add, please join in. That's the basics of it. Either an auction or a raffle, we haven't decided yet. Or both. And we're off and we're looking for feedback. Does anybody have any feedback? Uh, I'll take a lamp and possibly that tractor that we just bought. Those, both of those would be awesome in my house. We're going to charge a lot of money to help our budget. Are we thinking of um, keeping one for the Historical Society? We do have, um, there's actually 13 existing, um, so we are keeping one. Um, in discussions with my staff, they felt like it would be um, nice to put one somewhere in the district, but they weren't sure where. I think that's probably a good area, so um, I, I did agree to let that staff think that through, and we only are asking for approval for 12 of them, so. Great. So believe it or not, they're only from the 70s. Are the 1770s? <laughs> <laughs> they're still cool. they're older. Any they're other comments? Go ahead. No, they're close to 50. Yeah, I, uh, Commissioner, I have a question. Uh, Terry, what? What is the estimated value, do you think, of each lamp? I, I'm not sure. I would have to do a little research on that. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I've, I've been told before that the value of something is however much you can get for it. So, but I don't know how, about how that exactly. applies. <laughs> we don't want to put a limit on our fundraising efforts here um, by putting out a value. But really, there's a historic value and a tie to Park Ridge. So what somebody's willing to pay for that nostalgia. <laughs> yeah, it's big, right, Margaret? Yes, definitely. <laughs> and and, and there, yeah. are, there are some around town in people's yards. Um, apparently some others have been removed before. Yeah, they might have been from the city properties because my understanding is they matched what these were with city funds as well. So, okay, anything else? May we have a roll call vote, please? Please, Commissioner Tunnel. 
Yes. Commissioner Grau? Yes. Commissioner Harrington? Yes. Commissioner LaDuc? Yes. Commissioner Leach? Yes. Michelle Donnell? Yes. Commissioner Coyne? Aye. With that, I turn the floor over to Commissioner Tunnel. Uh, at this point, I have nothing to report, so I turn over the floor to Commissioner LaDuke. And I also have nothing to report. So on to communications and correspondence. I can speak to that. Um, if, just refer you to the last page. It's uh, 73 in the print copy, but probably 74 on your um, electronic copy, but is a letter, um, you know, annually we get audited um, for the pools. And especially I would like to commend, uh, especially this year with our challenges, um, you know, with COVID and staffing and et cetera, et cetera. I would like to commend uh, Ethan Williams, our um, aquatic manager and his team for getting a perfect score on the audits that were done this summer. And obviously that has a financial benefit back to the district um, because the um, higher we higher we score, the more um, reimbursement we get. So we're getting our maximum amount of reimbursement. So congratulations to April, Ethan and their team on that. You're here. Awesome. Okay. Any co other comments on that? Any new business? I have new business that really I meant to put in my president's uh, report, which is to again reiterate how proud I am to be affiliated with this organization and how hard uh, staff has worked um, throughout this uh, COVID crisis. Um, it's it. Again, I've used the word amazing, which I think is an over word, overused word, but um, it is nothing short of amazing what you guys have done this year. And uh, I look forward to marathon meetings where you guys have obviously put in a lot of time for our budget, uh, for our budgets. And um, I know that I'll be appreciative of all the work that you've done there. So I just want to say thank you for the record uh, again. So that's that's all I have. Any other new business? I second that. Great job for, to everyone. And thank you to the fellow board members. It's been a quite an interesting year. So thank you to everyone. So. All right. I move to adjourn the meeting of the uh, Board of Park Commissioners. Second. Second. Uh, roll call vote, please. Commissioner Grau? Yes. Mr. Harrington? Yes. Mr. LaDuke? Yes. Mr. Leach? Yes. Mr. O'Donnell? Yes. Mr. Tunnel? Yes. Mr. Coyne? Aye. Thank you. Thank you all. Now have a good night. Thank you, Thank you very Bye. much. Good night, everybody. Bye.